Hello, this is Mark Kaffer. I'm executive director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and we're very pleased to offer our uh, March webinar on advanced AI techniques applied to rail monitoring using fiber optic sensing. And we have a great presentation on hand from the team at uh, AP Sensing. Uh, this is a great opportunity to learn about the way uh, advanced technology can improve uh, rail safety and also the efficiency of a rail operation. So we look forward to hearing more from you guys. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Mark. All right, and hello, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, uh, depending on from where you're listening in. Um, I'm happy to, together with my colleague, give you um, a brief overview about um, yeah, what we do in terms of artificial intelligence with our distributed acoustic sensing technology, specifically for railway monitoring. My name is Daniel. I'm with the company AP Sensing 11 years, and I will start our webinar today giving you a brief overview first um, of our company and what the acoustic sensing technology with fiber optics generally is and how we use that for our railway monitoring application. So AP Sensing actually, um, just a few words here. We originally come from Hewlett and Packard. So these two gentlemen and gentlemen here in front of their garage, they started as a test and measurement company back in 39. And in fact, their first production site outside of the US was in Böblingen, which is a small town close to Stuttgart in the southern area of Germany. This is where we are located uh, with our headquarters here in Germany. Um, in 99, when HP, well, they, they've grown quite rapidly. And then they kind of spun off the whole measurement business into a new company called Agilent Technologies. And HP continued with um, all the IT related equipment, let's say and Agilent took over the whole measurement part from HP, so electronic, chemical, also network testing, and also fiber optic test equipment. And in 2007, something similar happened again, when the whole fiber optic sensing business from Agilent was spun off into a new company called AP Sensing, um, a company dedicated to the fiber optic sensing business. Um, and this is what we do today, so this is a bit where we come from, and. We've grown since then, so in the last, well, 13, 14 uh, years as AP Sensing with our headquarter in Germany. So as I said, in the southern area of Germany, in Böblingen, and uh, then we yeah, offices worldwide uh, where, we, where we do our business and where we support our projects and our customers in various different applications across the globe. So AP Sensing, what we do, um, generally, fiber optic sensing, obviously, so distributed fiber optic sensing, and we have two main uh, technologies in our portfolio, which we de develop and where we build our solutions around. One is the distributed temperature sensing technology, where the fiber optic cable or the optical fiber is like a very long thermometer. So that can be many kilometers long, and then you measure the temperature along this fiber optic cable. You can use that for different purposes. For example, for fire detection, you can imagine you simply install a fiber optic sensor cable along a ceiling of a tunnel, for example, or along a conveyor belt or a cable tray, and then you measure the temperature along that fiber optic cable, um, and you can exactly pinpoint all the temperature events along that cable. So if somewhere, for example, um, if there's some, somewhere a fire because of a, of a car accident or on a hotspot developing along a conveyor belt, for example, you can pinpoint the exact location, you measure the temperature, you give alarms, you can activate countermeasures, etc. And this temperature sensing technology is used for various different applications, and you see a brief overview here. So our different markets where we use that fiber optic sensing technology for temperature measurements and, and fire detection and cable monitoring and pipeline leak detection. So when it leaks, it gets, depending on the medium in the pipeline, either warm or it gets cold and you can pick that up. And similarly, we have another technology, which is the distributed acoustic sensing based on fiber optics. Um, this is a bit similar. So you also have a system you measure along the whole fiber optic cable. But in this case, you, you don't look for the temperature events, but you look for the acoustic events along the fiber optic cable. And I have in the next slide, um, I, I will briefly explain also how that works. And this then can again be used for different purposes in these different markets. 
Um, so obviously for railway monitoring, this is what we will talk about today for train tracking, for the whole condition monitoring of the railway infrastructure, also for events like cable theft or intrusion detection, for example. So there are various different, uh, let's say, sub applications within that market. And the same way we also use that for, again, if we take the example of a pipeline to pick up, for example, leaks. So if somewhere is a, in a high pressure gas pipeline, for example, if there's a leak, um, you can pick up this vibration um, which happens during a, a leak um, event and uh, you can pinpoint then the exact location of that leak point. Or similarly, if somebody, for example, with, a, with an excavator or other digging uh, heavy machinery equipment comes too close to your cable or to your very pipeline or, or so, you can pick this event up, you can categorize it uh, correctly and then you can give the alarm. So what is a fiber optic acoustic sensing system? How does that actually work? Um, and without getting too much into the physical details, um, what you can imagine is you have a, a system, an interrogator, and this is this, uh, the gray box which you see here on the bottom. That's our uh, distributed acoustic sensing, which consists of an interrogator unit and a processing unit. And then you have a fiber optic cable connected to that, and this fiber optic cable can be uh, kilometers long, as I mentioned, 10 kilometers, 20, 50, 70 kilometers or longer. Um, and you measure, or you, we send in a laser pulse into that fiber, and we measure the backscattered signal. So the, the light which we send in from our laser pulse, which we send into the fiber, is scattered back or reflected back along the complete fiber optic cable at the so-called scattering center, so essentially the molecules in the fiber. And this backscattered signal is analyzed in our, uh, with our controller. So we take, up, we take these backscattered signals and we analyze them and then we, we see based on that, on that backscattered signal what is happening. And now you can imagine, for example, if like in this example here, a train is passing by, this event of that train is causing vibration uh, signals in the ground. So uh, the train passes by and it causes vibration and the frequencies of the acoustic waves, they travel through the ground, so through the solid, solid ground, and these waves also propagate through the fiber which is in the ground. And as the acoustic waves hit the fiber, they basically shift the molecules in the fiber away, so in a very microscopic uh, small scale of course, but actually it causes a vibration of these molecules in the fiber. And because we're looking at the backscattered signal, this causes interferences in the, in, the, in the backscattering signal. And we can pick these interferences up and you can, with that uh, technology or with this approach, you can really see all the different events which are happening there. And obviously it could be a, a train, it could be a car passing by, it could be somebody walking maybe across the, the cable, it could be a digger. So an excavating machine or whatever, um, all these events, they cause um, acoustic waves traveling through the, the fiber and we pick these up as interferences. And each signal is also different, of course. I mean, a, a, a train, for example, has a different, let's say, acoustic footprint compared to somebody digging with a, with a shovel or so. So it does the sound quality and the frequencies, the, the, all the, these patterns are different depending on the, on the acoustic event. And the challenge then is really to categorize these correctly, to process the data correctly, not to just look at what is happening or that something's happening and there's something loud, but also really to categorize these events uh, properly. And that's exactly what we, what we are doing and <laughs> what we will talk um, today about and, and uh, yeah, give you a, a bit of an, a background information how this, um, this is utilizing the artificial intelligence or the advances in artificial intelligence also for, the, uh, for that type of application. Here's an example of how that can then, in a, in a rather easy way, uh, can look. So we have on the screen here a, um, a track, a rail track, just a section of it. See from north to south, there's a train track. The fiber optic cable is installed along the train track. So it's just in the trench uh, next to the, to the railway, actually. And we see these two signals here. And uh, as I will um, start the, the small video, you will see the two signals um, yeah, propagating uh, to each other. They, they will actually cross because it's two train tracks actually in parallel. So we have two trains which pass by here. We have only one fiber optic cable. So hence, you see one signal. I will just start the video here. 
and you see these two signals just stay approaching and uh, in this case they are not crashing but they're just passing by um, the two parallel tracks. So a simple graphical representation of the acoustic energy along the fiber optic cable. And we see here, we, we saw in this one section, there was a, a bridge where you see, I can also start that again, where you see how the, the event actually expands. It's not that the train is getting larger suddenly, but it's because there's a, a bridge and then obviously the whole bridge is vibrating as soon as the, uh, the train is um, approaching the bridge. So here you see that quite nicely. Um, so this is just an example on how the acoustic events or the acoustic waves really influence the, the fiber. Um, and this is measured by the acoustic sending system. Another example here, what you can do um, with this uh, acoustic sensing technology along uh, railways, um, we see here, um, yeah, on the, on the left side, you see a trench just next to this uh, rail track here where the fiber optic cable is installed. So it's, it's using a existing single mode fiber installed in the trench along the railway. And on the right side, we see a so-called waterfall graph. Um, and you have the acoustic energy here. So the, something's happening because uh, we see a train what is passing by. Um, you see the distance down there and the train is moving in that direction. So if we analyze that a little bit, you see from the time, because yeah, the time in this case goes that direction, um, you see that the train is moving in this direction. Uh, we can also do some analysis here. So when you look at that a bit more detailed, you can see where's the start, where's the end of the train. And when you analyze that, you see exactly, okay, that's 400 meters here. And that's in that case, um, the exact length of the train. So you really have the full event of, in this case, of this 400 meter Eurostar um, reflected in the acoustic footprint, uh, which, we, which we've uh, picked up with our acoustic sensing system. So in this case, it's rather straightforward because there's not much happening and you have a train, you expect the train, you just look at the details on how the train looks. The real challenge actually happens when we go into, well, into a real scenario, into real life, let's say. So then if I go to the next slide here, that's a scenario which is more closer to the reality, let's say. We have on the, again, on the right side, we see the waterfall graph. On the left side, we have a, uh, simply a map. We see a train track here in this area. And now we, we can mark some points here. We have a road crossing here. We have another road crossing there. So where the, the street simply crosses over a bridge. And we have a train station here. And you see that reflected in the waterfall graph. So this here is obviously the train. And you see as the train approaches the station, it stops. So that's why the signal disappears completely because there's no vibration anymore in the ground. And then it starts again and accelerates. So that's why the, the energy again here is visible on the waterfall graph. And we have some other signals here, these signals, which look more stationary here and here. And it's simply because the cars are just passing almost, um, yeah, almost 90 degrees um, across the, the train track. That's why we see all these little signals there. And now the real challenge, of course, when you want to utilize such a system for, well, in a in real life scenario, is to pick all these different events up and categorize them correctly so that the system knows, okay, that is a train and this is not a train, that's a car, or this is an excavator or whatever, all these different little uh, things which for the human eye are quite obvious, but for a machine or a computer like a distributed acoustic sending system, it's much more complicated. And this is where I hand over to my colleague Bernd, who will give <laughs> you a bit more details into that part. Yeah, thank you. That's always just the same game. If it's get complicated, he hands it over to R&D people. <laughs> Hello from my side, my name is Bernd Rapp and I'm with AP Sensing uh, since 2015 and uh, on this slide I um, want to show you how we can sense our environment and uh, what we can do with classical evaluation and what we can do with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so typically, I hope you can, you can see the mouse. Uh, yes. So. Typically, we have acoustic uh, energies, acoustic events, and we have a detector, we detect it, and then we can do a classical data evaluation and get information out of that. So we can um, 
uh, evaluate the evaluate the intensity of the signal. We can say if it's moving or it's uh, stationary. We can evaluate the size and the duration in time, and probably also the location. So with this classical data evaluation, it is possible to detect the train uh, and probably also a car. So as you have a, tra a train, uh, it's it's loud, it's fast, uh, it's long and the sensor cable um, is laid along the uh, railway track so there's a high probability that the event will be a train so but can you distinguish between a train and a car or can you even distinguish between a truck and a sports car so wouldn't it be a good idea to have something in between here which is a kind of intelligence an artificial intelligence and the approach of artificial intelligence is completely different. So people from artificial intelligence, they don't ask about intensity or they don't ask about size or duration and time of, an, of a signal. They ask different, different questions. They ask whether the data match any of the trains event. And that's where they want to train their network uh, with all these events. And on my next slide, I like to give you a short differentiation and what you uh, of all these um, terms of artificial intelligence and what you can do with all the things. So first, you have the data, and uh, with classical um, data evaluation, you can gain information out of the data. So you have the acoustic energy, you gain information, you can get the velocity and the size and duration or the location of an event, and with machine learning, which is part of the artificial intelligence, uh, you can uh, derive knowledge from the data. So you can uh, get information of what it is, what's the pattern you see. Is, is this a train, is it a car, is it uh, a person walking along the track? And with artificial intelligence, you can even go further. So you can apply the knowledge um, you, you gain so you can apply the knowledge and, and you can make decisions uh, for uh, the process in the future. So with deep learning networks you open the, the window into the future and, and, and you can um, make decisions for, for the future. So um, predictive maintenance here is the keyboard maybe. So and if you want um, to use um, neural networks and artificial learning technologies here i have a short overview and um, what you can do with them here is uh you have here different uh, learning techniques like the uh decision trees or the support vector machines or deep learning networks and uh, here on this graph you see the learning performance of all these different techniques so the decision tree yeah, has a quite low learning performance but it has a high explainability, and I will show you what I mean with that. So let's assume you want to know what it, uh, it's a good uh, or weather condition to play golf or not. So make a table with uh, the outlooks, the wind conditions, the temperatures, and you experience whether it was good to play golf or not. So let's say if it's sunny, it's windy, the temperature is fair, is around 25 degrees, uh, should better not play golf. Uh, or if it's overcast and have no wind, it's a good day for playing golf. It's okay. I can list a lot of all, all these features here and uh, your decisions to go golfing or not. And the decision tree is able to draw this um, picture out from this table. So you can decide what is the outlook is it rainy? Is it windy? Uh, if, if yes, uh, don't play golf. Um, if it's not windy, you can go for golfing. This is uh, what you can do with a decision tree. And here in this picture, you can see uh, the influence of the data size. With a decision tree, here the data size is quite low. And uh, the model performance of a decision tree is, is quite good. But if you want to uh, deal with uh, large amounts of data as we have for, for train tracking uh, 
a decision tree is certainly not the best solution. So we should use large neural networks like the deep learning systems. And this is how a deep learning system looks like. In principle, uh, you have a, have a data input vector and you have a kind of matrix and an output vector. And inside this matrix, um, you have um, a, a bank of numbers and the training of the network is to adjust these numbers so that if, if you input the, the data vector, you will get out the output vector um, well, um, what the event really is. So to make it a little bit clearer, I would like to go uh, with you behind the scene of such a deep neural network. Um, let's assume we have a picture of a car. So we as a human, we see a car, but a computer, uh, uh, he only sees a feature map and uh, this neural network takes part of the picture, condense the information to only one point uh, in, this, in this network. And then we reduce, in the next step, we reduce the size of this matrix. This is what we call pooling. And then again, we cluster some of these information points and link it to another point. This is uh, another compression or better a convolution. That's why they uh, also are named a convolutional neural networks. And in the end, uh, you start with a car, but uh, you end up with a, a, a feature map. So this is, here you can see the car, but we as a human cannot recognize that this is a car, but a computer can do this. This is why um, I say the, the explainability disappears. And this is the same what we can do with our acoustic um, fingerprints. We measured with the DAS along the, the, the railway track. So we have these pictures from the waterfall plot and we do a convolution of the information and end up with such a feature map, which we trained um, in, in our network. And this is uh, a picture of how it works. So we input uh, a lot of these pictures and say what it is, it's a target output. And we let the system run and see what the output is, and we feed the output back into a correction loop. And um, so we can do this again and again. Um, and if the predicted output fits well to the target output, the, the system is trained. And here I have a little video which shows you uh, how a trained system works. We have a couple of pictures, and the computer is able to distinguish between no background noise and the train. Uh, let me start here. Ah, I can see noise, 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 noise. It's a train, no, train noise. And here you can see it's a strong signal, but it's not a train, obviously. It's, it's, it's part of the noise. And so the system is trained to distinguish between train and noise. Yeah, what are the challenges if you want to implement such a trained system uh, into a uh, rain monitoring system? Um, one of the major challenges is that if you want to uh, track a train along his route, uh, it should be a live system and you need an end-to-end -end system with real-time processing. And you have to handle a lot of data in real time. And that's why we use these convolution steps. Uh, we have to condense the information. And here is uh, now the, the application um, of the trained neural network to the train tracking. Here again, it's a waterfall plot here. The time starts here and the distance starts here. This is the distance along the track. You see different acoustic events. Here is the uh, highway bridge. And here are some trains, uh, train stations where the train stops. And uh, a really complex situation is when two trains are crossing. For us as a human, it's clear this is a train runs from this direction, this direction, and this is another, another train which runs in the opposite direction. It's obvious for us as, as a human, it's clear that a train does not make a U-turn here. But for a computer, it's quite difficult to distinguish these this two trains. 
But with our system, we're able to distinguish between the two trains because we know where the train is. We, we have different information about the tracks. We have different fingerprints for different tracks. So we can say the train is on track one or on track B. So we can know that this track is on, let's say, track one, and we can follow it on track one, and this train is on track two, and we can follow it on track two. So what we can do is we can uh, uh, represent the train by a data tuple, so give him a time, an ID, and the location, and the velocity. And in my next slide, I have a demo. Here again, this is the waterfall plot, and here we have uh, the track A and track B, and the train on track B and track A, and this is another train on track B. And uh, here on the this diagram, you can see the velocity of the train. So we have different trains with different IDs, and now let's see how they move. Yes, and this very interesting. They keep on their own track. You can see they keep on their own track, they don't change the track. We know where it is and which track it is. This is an I think it's a very nice example how you can use artificial intelligence techniques for train tracking. Yeah, this is on uh, one example. So your output from, uh, of a neural network depends on your input. So if you input the signal, uh, a waterfall chart with events, you will come out with event classification, it's a train or it's noise or a car. If you go further with signal processing and you train the system with the train signatures, uh, your output uh, will be the train location, the speed, the length, and the condition of the train, maybe. And if you move further and train your system with the railway response, because the, uh, you will be able uh, to make comments on and statements on the condition of, the, of your railway. So we have seen that it's able uh, to locate the train and to uh, estimate the speed of, of the train, but uh, these artificial neural networks, especially these deep learning networks, uh, with their uh, increased learning capacity can be really uh, fast adapt to all other applications. So we have applied it to cable thefts or through uh, intrusion detection. Uh, you can use it for detection of, of flat wheels or rock fall detection or even for level cross management uh, and also for track condition of monitoring so this is only a selection of the application which will be able with a deep neural network um, so let me summarize um, these artificial technologies are a very powerful tool in our toolbox for signal processing techniques so they uh, deliver data input to uh, a digital twin of uh, your um, environment and this enables completely new applications like pre-driving, uh, better capacity planning, you even can increase the network capacity um, and it's also able uh, to do a real smart and predictive maintenance with this technology. So, as everything has, uh, everything, every metal has two sides, so uh, also artificial intelligence um, has some um, challenges, and, and one of the major challenges is certainly uh, the quality and the quantity of the sensor data. But nevertheless, um, it's a very powerful tool, and the learning performance enables a fast adaption to different environments, and uh, we have a readily available tools to increase the speed of the deployment with, with these of, um, of the artificial intelligence networks. Um, yeah, this was all from my side so far. I would like to thank you, 
Uh, and also, I would uh, like to thank my colleagues who contributed to uh, this presentation, also to uh, the German Ministry of Transport and the Deutsche Bahn Netze. And uh, that was all from my side so far. Well, thank you very much. So I guess we'll kick off with, with some questions and uh, uh, sort of threshold question is, of course, railroads in the United States are under a mandate to uh, move towards uh, PTC, positive train control, which is sort of using uh, signaling, uh, existing signaling and, and updating that. Um, can you give me a little insight as to sort of what are the, what's the potential, what are the opportunities for integrating uh, fiber optic sensing, the results from fiber optic sensing uh, with other, uh, other methods or modes of uh, rail signaling? Uh, there's a quite high potential because uh, we can hand over our data to an upper level software platform um, and they can integrate it in their, uh, so all railway operators can integrate our information in their system and they can use it um, for better planning, for uh, train localization. Yeah, so there, there's an, an interface uh, from our data system to the outside and, and to all, all these um, higher level uh, platforms. Next question is is kind of an installation question is kind of what is the best location? Does it matter where the location is along the rail right away in order to get the best uh, best results? And uh, the best location is certainly pretty close to the track. Um, but we have a very good experience if, if you use the cable which is already there. So in, in many cases you have a, a fiber optic cable for data transmission already uh, there and it lays along the track in, in, a, in a trough. So you can use this uh, cable for, for sensing. And I, and I have a question here, I guess, having to do with sort of the ability to do the sort of advanced learning that you described, which is, can the system distinguish between a rock fall and uh, thermal pops in the rail due to temperature changes? Ah, the temperature change typically go, uh, it is a slower event than a rock fall. So um, you can train rock falls and you certainly can distinguish then between rock falls and, and temperature. It's a question of training and how many data sets and how many pictures you you uh, apply to the neural network. Got it. So the next question is, is, uh, is it possible to parameterize just to have alarms for people of uh, say uh, some distance like a kilometer ahead of, uh, uh, of a train? Um, what, what exactly do you mean? When, when people are on the track? Yes, when I, I think it, I, I assume the question refers to um, where there may be intrusion or, uh, you know, obviously unexpected uh, uh, folks on on the right of way, whether it's possible to uh, uh, sort of set it up so that you can do identification in advance of, uh, of a rail that's going past that, that particular point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Bruce, yes, it's possible uh, to see whether there's a, something ahead, but we can not distinguish between a human and, and animals on the track. Got it. Okay. It, it, you initially mentioned that microphones are really references microphones, but really the sensors um, are can I'm trying to follow this basically do location down to uh, 10 meters, but since the train is 400 uh, meters wide or long, uh, can you explain the granularity of your spatial resolution in that case? So I guess it's, it's I, if I understand the question, it's really differentiating along the cost, the sort of a, a length of a train. Uh, Yes, uh, at the moment, our, um, I would say the um, special correctness is um, around two meters. 
Okay. So question, what happens if the fiber breaks along the route, say due to vandalism or some other, uh, some other issue? Yeah, this is, if it is a standard fiber optic cable, and I think this is one of the beauties of this technology that you can just use an existing uh, communication fiber, which you have there anyways. When that breaks, well, then of course the system measures only up to the break and not beyond the break, but it will also tell you where the break is, so that that you then, as an operator, you can well go there and fix the break. So you basically uh, have to repair the break and splice the fiber, and then just continue measuring. So it's not required to replace then the cable in that case. So next question is, what are the available training methods to detect uh, train collision or a derailed train? Well, uh, sorry, can I, can I say it again, please? Um, so I, I guess the question is about the training, or I, I don't know if it's the learning, but the uh, the, the the amount of training that's required to be able to detect derailment. So do you have to, I guess the, this is really aimed at the operator. So maybe the question is really addressed of, do you have to do specialized training uh, for the operators of the system to be able to, to, to uh, interpret <laughs> the data they're receiving? Yeah, as you can imagine, it's really a, a critical point. Uh, if you want to train a system with a thousand of cases of, of a derailed train, um, in, in such a case, we we have a combination of um, a classical rule-based uh, data evaluation and an artificial intelligence network. So in, in our system, we have both in parallel. So the derailment would have a very special signature, which we can easily detect with a classical rule-based algorithms. So it's not, nece not necessary that we train derailment. So I, I guess I, as I would follow up, obviously with other with other uh, fiber optic systems, it really is not a lot of that interpretative work that needs to be done by the operator, since as you've described, the software and the advanced learning has been uh, programmed to detect the event. So it's not that they're sitting there looking at the waterfall chart trying to understand what it means, but that they've given yeah. alerts based on that data. I, I think maybe that's the what, one way to approach that. Um, yeah. Next question is, deep learning typically requires uh, 100,000 data examples. That's at least the question to achieve satisfactory results. So mm. then the question is, 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 do you have that data? How much data do you rely on in order to reach your conclusions? Um, yeah, it's right. It's uh, you, you need thousands or even hundred thousands of, of, of pictures and datasets to train uh, the network. And meanwhile, we have uh, uh, yeah almost one million of pictures we trained. But this is yeah, it's just an issue and it's time consuming to to train the system. Got it. And I guess follow up to that, it's a separate question, but uh, how much, how adaptive is your system to new installation sites? So I guess, do you have to, uh, how much specialized or localized uh, mm -hmm. programming or interpretation needs to be done for uh, new locations? Um, it's, it can be very, very fast because the learning performance of this uh, convolutional neural networks is quite high, and that's why we, we have chosen them. Um, so if you have trained your system on one track and you want to go for another tra for another track, uh, you only need, a, I would say, a couple of days or weeks um, to adapt the system to the new environment. It's the same maybe, um, you're using uh, Google or Alexa um, in your home. You also can train Google and Alexa to recognize your voice. And therefore, it's necessary uh, to say a couple of sentences, five or eight or ten sentences. It's not necessary to train Alexa with all the languages and all the sentences in your language. It's only uh, a few sentences to adapt Alexa from all the trained uh, persons before to your uh, individual uh, voice. And that's the state they also use uh, 
convolutional neural network behind and this also the same kind of technology we are using and so it's really f the, the learning performance is quite high and it's a very fast adaptable so here's a recurring question do you recommend a single mode tight buffer cable or armored or unarmored design for sensing applications uh, generally the unarmored is better so uh, the more let's say shields you have around your your fiber optic cable the higher you you attenuate the the frequencies which propagate through the ground so in this case an unarmored cable is better than an armored cable it doesn't say that with an armored cable it doesn't work at all um, but generally um, the, the the more the fiber is really uh, let's say exposed to the ground or to the surrounding better Next one is, uh, how long do you need for system calibration? So I guess this is really sort of uh, referencing cable length and, and channels to, tr and to track uh, kilometers. Uh, that's really, um, it's, a, it's a simple question, but there's not a, a simple answer. You need one day or you need five days or you need 20 days because it really depends on the complexity of each project. And as each project is different, of course, so not talking about the machine learning part, what Vern just said, um, but about the, the simple fiber route, how many additional splices you have, maybe some overlay of, of uh, fiber in some sections. Um, this, this is just different and depends on the project. I would say from, from my experience, um, anything between, I don't know, a few days to maybe two to four weeks for complex projects. Um, can be done. So it, it really depends on the complexity of each project. And actually, sort of following up on the prior question, which is, uh, do you need to deploy fiber optic cables solely for DAS, or can you use uh, existing um, fiber? Yeah, no, that's that's the the beauty of that technology. You really can use the existing fiber. Um, so it, it needs to be a, a dark fiber, so an unused single mode fiber. Um, you cannot use a, a fiber where you send other signals and other where's other light going on in the fiber, let's say. Um, but you can use the existing cable and for all the, the projects which we've done so far, actually there was always an existing fiber optic cable where we could simply hook up our, our system to an existing um, fiber. And, and I just add to that, obviously, being able to rely on existing fiber greatly uh, reduces the uh, potential installation costs because you don't have to put the fiber down. You can yeah. just put in the system. Um, another question about other potential applications and in, in can you use the system to monitor earthquakes? Yes, absolutely. Um, definitely. Uh, this is, a com of course, a completely different application. Um, but certainly, um, you can use that, and in fact, uh, we're doing that already. So, um, yes, yeah. simple answer, yes. Very nice signals, very clear signals. Um, let me see. So, uh, how, how dependent is artificial intelligence model performance on the way images are generated? I'm not, is the image generation part fixed or is it adaptive? So uh, this may really require you to do kind of a little explanation that the, the image is really a representation, but go ahead, why don't you explain that? Um, yes, yeah, we use um, images which describe the situation quite, quite well, quite good. Uh, these are real uh, pictures. Um, I think this is one of the, of, of the, uh, of the requirements you have. Um, to make this uh, artificial networks really run, running. Does this answer your question? I, I think so. I mean, I think it's really kind of, the, the, yes, I, I, it does. Obviously, obviously the, the, the artificial intelligence is not based on the image, but is the image is a representation of what is being picked up from the data. Is that yeah. a fair description of, of really what, what we're what we're talking about here. Yeah. All right. Um, so another question about uh, about the sort of experience. Uh, obviously, you've you referenced the uh, Deutsch, uh, you know, the G German rails. Uh, what kind of experience have you had in the United States and, and outside of Europe? 
Um, so we're doing uh, projects in, in different countries and I, I cannot uh, reveal all the details here in, in, in that webinar. So if whoever wants to know a bit more can certainly uh, contact me here, my contact details on the slide. Um, but yes, it is not only Deutsche Bank. Fair enough. Obviously, they've been a leader in, in advancing the technology yeah. and, and can be commended for that. All right, I got another fiber question. This is a, a softball question for you, which is, can you use the same fiber for DAS and for strain sensing? Uh, so when you say strain sensing um, by attaching another instrument to the fiber, then the answer is no. So you will need a fiber only for DAS, as I said already, it's a, it can be on, it can be an existing cable. You don't need to deploy a separate cable for that, but it needs to be a separate fiber only for DAS. And then, if you want to measure something separately, be it temperature or strain or whatever other technology, then you you need to use different um, fibers for that. So next one is is in the train tr in the train tracking application. Are you able to show where the front and the end of the train is, and if so, how accurately? Uh, yes, it's the uh, what we currently do is we uh, show the acoustic head of the train, and it is a little bit so the, the acoustic event is a little bit larger than than the real train, but uh, at, at the moment we. Um, yeah, we determine the the um, acoustic head uh, of the train. But it's if you have enough in, information about the train lengths, uh, and, and it's also possible to do the exact train lengths. And as I mentioned before, the uh, accuracy is about two meters. Right. So, what is the system performance when the fiber is installed on side walls inside tunnels? So oh, we don't have experience with uh, side wall installation so far. We have experience with uh, above ground uh, duct installations, and here it's a little bit difficult because the the, um, the duct vibrates and and the velocity of the vibration is much faster than, than the trains. We get uh, it's a bit more difficult to uh, interpret the, the pictures. Um, so generally what we have to, to keep in mind is the physics behind um, and the physics apply no matter uh, where and how you use it. Um, and we saw earlier this one example of the bridge where you saw suddenly the, the acoustic, the very simple representation of the acoustic energy expanding because the whole bridge was vibrating and hence the whole fiber along the bridge was affected um, equally, let's say, by the vibration. And in a tunnel, um, again, the, it's not the, the, the things you hear with the, with the human ear, uh, where you can then locate where the things are coming from, but it's the vibration in the ground which the uh, dust system picks up. And when the fiber is further away, of course, that attenuation, the attenuation goes up and hence the vibration goes down. So when you go outside of the ground and then above to the ceiling or to the, to the, wall, to the walls of a tunnel, I should say, then certainly the attenuation increases. And even though it's quite loud in a tunnel, of course, but the, the actual frequencies through the, 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 the solid material, that of course goes down the further you go away with, with your fiber. So hence it's, it's rather challenging when a fiber is installed at the wall in, in a tunnel. So the, the, probably the whole fiber is then affected in a similar way. We're look, looking forward to do some tests. Okay. Uh, are you able to distinguish between the issues on, say, w the wheels of a train versus track conditions? So I guess the question is, are there d this different signatures that you work with? Yeah, so the, the difference is, um, where is the, where's it coming from? So and when we have the situation, if it's the rail which is degrading or changing its parameters, let's say, or if it's a wheel, uh, then, I mean, one thing is the, the rail, which is stationary, so, uh, so when the train is, is passing by, then the, the frequencies of the train change again. So it's not the wheel, but it suddenly disappears, so it's, it cannot be the train, but it, it must be the rail, and you will see then the same effect when different trains uh, pass actually that same location. 
So this is then that, that, that what we call condition monitoring of a rail uh, railway infrastructure, where it's then not so much about really the train location and speed, etc., but about the condition, because the, you can pick this up by the change of the of the frequencies or the acoustic footprint of the asset of that rail. So this is this is possible, yes. So the next question is about reliability and the uh, uh, the prevalence of um, false alarms. That is an open question. What is the question exactly? <laughs> well, I guess the question is 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 how big a problem um, are false alarms, and, and does that make the system does that create challenges for the reliability of the system? Maybe try and rephrase it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, it, I mean it depends always on what the user wants wants to do. If it's about really train tracking, so tracking the location, the speed, the the size, the integrity of the train. It's not so much about alarming. It's more a representation of the of the infrastructure. Actually, when you talk about alarming, so for example, trespassing or cable theft or so, it's again also all about uh, training and calibration of the system. So it's it's like actually it's the same no matter which technology you apply. So that's not only for the acoustic sensing, but any technology you use for any purpose. Actually, it's a trade off between sensitivity and uh, false alarm rate. So the more sensitive you want your system, for example, let me make a simple example, you want to detect a person walking 10 meters away from the train track. This is of course a very, very light signal only, very low. If you want that, might be technically possible, but on the other hand, it will increase the, the potential false alarm rate because other signals might also be quite low and appearing uh, along your train track. So it's always a trade-off between the sensitivity and the false alarm rate, and then certainly a matter of training. So you can always adapt the system after a while. That's yeah. why for, for those uh, projects, we usually have a training phase, uh, phase yeah. of adaption of, of in, you know, improving the models, uh, adapting the thresholds, et cetera, et cetera, to then eventually come to, to a, a good result. Uh, that's a great, a gr yeah. That's a great answer for understanding the way the systems work. Are, are you using a supervised or a unsupervised neural network? At the moment, it's, it's a su uh, supervised neural network. And let me see. We already addressed the issue of pre-installed fiber, so I think we've already. Obviously, that's uh, um, what. I, Well, this one is really a, a refresh of the earlier question about accuracy. So, uh, and ask about how much training is necessary. I think that probably decide the answer was really more: what are you, what are you trying to, how, how, how many false positives, how, how precise are you trying to do? So, I think you've already yeah. answered that. Uh, uh, and this one, I guess, is a more open-ended question, but it's somewhat related to what you just answered. But how long does it take for the learning or calibration period? It depends on the complexity of the environment. It's difficult yeah. to say. So the computer itself runs very, very fast. It runs very, very fast. But uh, you have to uh, record all these this, this pictures and uh, remember. Uh, meanwhile, we trained uh, approximately one million of, of pictures. The, the, the biggest effort is to to uh, recall the pictures and to label the picture. And, and so here's here's a general question. I guess we're getting into the more specific, the more on the range of uh, perhaps a follow up question. But uh, do you specifically support predictive maintenance? So I think that's a follow up question. But go ahead, you can handle that. Uh, I mean, if we support that, yes, we absolutely support that because it's a great, certainly a, a great value which such a technology can provide when we talk about predictive maintenance. And there's also what we what we try to show um, also during our webinar. This is where it goes, um, certainly. So one thing is the very simple acoustic representation of events which happen. So like the train passing, it's very straightforward. Um, when you then go to the bit more complex situations like okay a train does not make a u-turn so you have to distinguish between the tracks actually um, that's then uh, for us it looks very simple because for us for the human eye it's obvious but for for the machine it's not so obvious 
Um, and then we go further by by really differentiating the the the, the acoustic representation of the of the events or the, the frequencies which we see. Um, which might change over time, which then is an indication that something with the rail is changing this, so that it's degrading, for example, and you can detect like, like let's say bumps in simple words, bumps in your in your frequencies and the patterns, uh, which then give you an indication that something's happening there. So this is where the whole thing is going, of course, but for that you need really the whole, uh, well, the, the, the whole package um, actually. So uh, we're, we're kind of re doing repetitive questions, but let me try another one that's a little bit more detailed. Is there a likelihood of signal degeneration uh, with the time of the fiber is, that is exposed to constant laser pulsing sensing of the optical fiber? Is it better to have fiber encased in steel armor or uh, ADSS type cable? So you kind no. of addressed this earlier, but you can try it again. No, uh, the answer is quite simple. Uh, no, um, so there's no degradation um, of the fiber by the laser light which we send in. The laser power is so low that it's and it's, it's not it, happening. It's the same wavelengths as you use for telecommunications. Right. So the fiber is made for for that kind of laser. And as we talked about, the variety of fibers can can be used. Obviously, there are different yeah. advantages to specific fibers. But if fibers are already in place, that's obviously the, how shall I say, the the most economical approach to take. Uh, last question is one that I can answer, which is, will this presentation be available? Uh, and yes, uh, this will be uh, posted on uh, FOSA YouTube page. Uh, and uh, we have a fair amount of traffic. And actually, I've noticed from the past that uh, our rail-related webinars have generated a, a considerable level of interest. Uh, but probably within the next 24 hours, uh, Joy will have that up available. And we certainly welcome people to be able to drill down uh, and follow up perhaps more specific uh, you know, questions they may have be able to follow from that. Or alternatively, uh, obviously, your contact information is available. Uh, and uh, more specific or detailed questions can uh, uh, be sent to you at uh, AP Sensing. Gentlemen, we thank you for a very uh, informative presentation, uh, and that ends this uh, webinar. Thank you very much.